egotistical, so unpredictable Here on the SNL Network Yes, that is right. Hello, everybody. I hope you are enjoying your first week of coverage as we head towards season 47 of Saturday Night Live. My name is John Schneider here with the SNL Network, and I am so excited to bring you another podcast in the preseason as we prepare for season 47, only a few days away. So I'm very, very excited. Uh, this one will be a little bit different than what we did a couple days ago. What we did a couple days ago is we had our full season 47 preseason roundtable. It was really exciting. We were live on Monday night on YouTube talking with all of the different people who, uh, three different excellent guests and a bunch of people in the chat, everybody who wanted to talk about season 47, the new hosts that are coming in, some of the new cast members. We previewed all of that. So make sure to check out that show. And then today, we're going to talk all about statistics. So even though we aren't officially called SNL Stats anymore, we're still going to talk through the statistics and the numbers and the interesting things to look at numbers-wise as we go through Season 47. And joining us to do that is the master of the numbers, the keeper of the numbers, Mr. Mike Murray. Mike, how are you? I'm doing great. I'm, I'm pumped for Season 47. That summer went by wicked quick, but I'm ready for... Uh more and i also we've come a long way i think i probably had like 25 spreadsheets now i probably have like 96 so where yeah. we're doing the <laughs> snl supercomputer is needs some uh, extra terabytes yeah i'm so excited we're building all that data and you know that you're from boston mike because you said the summer went by wicked quick so that's, yeah, how, you, that's how you know <laughs> uh just tell the listeners who haven't heard from you since may how your summer was what were you up to besides just taking more you know stats and data um i you know i took a little snl break but um then i started just retooling it i updated some of the the uh you know formulas so that and every time we do that it does take a while to go back but summer was good just uh wedding planning got oh i got 17 days so yeah snl so uh, i'll be i'll be uh, i'll be in hawaii for one of the shows so maybe i'll watch snl at like 5 p.m that'll be cool that will be really cool. And um, yeah, very exciting times as you head towards your wedding. Uh, joining us also, I'm so excited to talk to her really, you know, for the first time in our season 47 coverage. It is Nicole Rovine. Nicole, how are you? I'm really good. I'm just chilling. I'm so excited to do our, our stats coverage. I think it's, it's a really fun thing we do. Mike is just amazing. And it's, it's cool to see your growth, as you said, how many spreadsheets you have now compared to when we were doing these a while ago. And it's just, it's like, it's crazy to see. And I'm so honored to be a part of it. Yeah, we're really happy to have you. So this is what we're going to do today. This is what we have, you know, on the menu, we're going to talk through some of the upcoming hosts, we're going to try and see where they would fit in statistically with some of the hosts we saw last season. How is that going to look? Uh, what does it mean for these three new cast members? Mike has taken some data and, and looked at the new cast members the last couple of years and how they have fared compared to the rest of the cast. We're going to talk about that. We'll certainly be talking about the departures of Beck and Lauren. Beck specifically took up a lot of the data we're going to talk about who may fill his role in terms of screen time and appearances on there there are some snl records that may be broken this season we're going to tell you about those records and what to watch for as we move forward from episode to episode and if we have time we might play a little game as well so mike let's get started while i'm bringing up your first chart with the hosts for last season tell everybody about you know we haven't heard from you what you think about these first four hosts that we got we got uh we have owen wilson hosting the premiere we have kim kardashian in week number two rami malik in week number three and the return of jason sudeikis in week number four so what do you think about them uh first thing that grabbed me was just uh first four timers um the first four hosts are our first timers, I should say. Um, that hasn't happened since season 36. Um, last season, that was a big trend that we saw. And, you know, we speculated if it was COVID related or not. But 14 out of 20 hosts last year. So like 70% of the hosts of 46 were first timers. That was the highest in 14 years. Um, so it, maybe this is uh, new for SNL um, to just keep getting fresh blood in there and, instead of, you know, old reliables. Also, maybe because... 47 years later some of the old reliables tom hanks steve martin you know alec baldwin maybe they're they've outgrown the show or they're just you know they don't need to do it anymore um but then we see people who are you know not necessarily uh young people like owen wilson who's been around for a long time um hosting which is exciting i just feel like 
he everyone said it already, but he's someone that you thought would have hosted in like 2004. And now here he is. So I'm excited to see him. I mean, I haven't heard a lot of chatter about it, but um, he'll be the oldest first timer to host an SNL premiere. Um, that was one stat I dug up. I mean, last wow. year we had Chris Rock and before uh, Woody Harrelson. So SNL likes to start off with, uh, you know, a middle aged dude to host the premiere, I guess. <laughs> That's so true. Um, but this is that that's actually a great stat. I didn't even know that that he was the oldest person to uh host a premiere. I guess that they usually go for somebody more like in the current zeitgeist, but they you know went for somebody who was there in 2005. Did you say the oldest first time host? Oldest first time host to host the premiere. Oh, right. Oldest first time oh, premiere host. Yeah, that's going all the way back to, to Carlin. Interesting. Okay. Yeah, that's crazy. That's that's a really good stat, Mike. Um, well, let's talk about this host. Let's try and figure out where we see them landing. Uh, so for those who are checking us out for the first time on these By the Numbers shows, Mike puts together a ranking for all of the cast members and all of the hosts. Mike, would you just tell the listeners how the ranking is determined so we can move forward with the conversation with their understanding? Sure, absolutely. I uh, just developed it over looking at two of the main factors of appearing on SNL, which is how often do you appear and in what capacity and for how long are you on the screen? Um, so whether you're on the screen physically or speaking, I count that as screen time. I, you know, There's a lot of math involved, but I'll say it really simple is that I just take those two variables, um, punch them into the computer, and I get this one value um, that just is basically a kind of a non-discriminatory um, math value. So whether you're always playing a crazy character or always playing a straight character, or you know you appear in background, or you know just on weekend update, it kind of just one value to assess, um, you know, and, and rank the cast members of that one particular episode. So if there's, you know, fifty cameos in the episode, that that's gonna you know dilute the cast score. And if there's no special guests, then you know some of the the uh, featured players might step forward that get a higher score. So this can go back all the way to season one. Um, and, you know, they'll be comparable whether or not, you know, it was the 70s or now. Yeah. And now that you have data on multiple seasons, it'll be really fun to talk through that this season. So last year, we had a ton of hosts that did pretty well in your rankings. Maya Rudolph led the way. We also had John Mulaney, Dave Chappelle, Kristen Wiig, Dan Levy, uh, uh, Daniel Kaluuya, Adele, uh, John Krasinski. Reggae Jean, Bill Burr, they were all above average hosts from last year. Uh, the rest that I didn't name were obviously below the average in terms of Mike's rankings. I want to talk through the first four hosts and let's do some predictions where we think they're going to fall, what type of host we see them in terms of just pure statistics. So let's talk through Owen Wilson at first. Uh, Nicole, do you have a prediction for us where you can see Owen Wilson falling along these rankings? Is he somebody at the end of the season we're going to talk about is being near the top or near the bottom? Well, if we're looking at last year, we noticed that a lot of the first half hosts had less screen time than they might have if they were second half. And that's because of COVID restrictions and things like that really shifted in the spring. And there was more, a greater number of people who could be in each sketch and so on. Um, so I'm not going to think too much in comparison to last year, uh, just because it was such a crazy time, of course. But I'm thinking it'll be pretty average in the end. Once we look back at the full season, um, they, I just think for the premiere, they have a lot of catching up to do a lot of ground to cover and a host, especially a first time host, even if he's a comedy vet, we don't know how much he's going to fill those roles of the, you know, the content that they have to catch us up on. So yeah, I, I'd say it'll end up being about average. I think that um, there aren't any, any sketches that we know for sure he's going to have a big role in, whereas we're going to talk about Jason and we just know for sure there are things that he will take up a lot of space in. So it's a little bit, um, there are more, more variables and I'd say less evidence behind those variables for, for him. Yeah, for sure. Mike, wh what do you think about this? I mean, I'm looking just at the data over here and Chris Rock finished fifth from the bottom last season and he was our premier uh, host. So how do you think that would compare to somebody like Owen Wilson this season? I put Owen Wilson at like 240. I think we should we should expect a long update in the premiere, and that always hurts the host because that just eats up like 14, 15 minutes if you do a long update. And traditionally, hosts don't pop up an update. 
only uh, Elon Musk was an update last season. So like most hosts don't ever make an appearance then. So I would say that will uh, count against them. Um, and then, yeah, they'll probably want to, uh, everyone who's in the building, they'll probably want to uh, showcase. So whether it be a lot or a little bit. So 21 cast members, biggest cast in history. Owen Wilson, first time host, um, probably won't do a long monologue, doesn't do stand up. So screen time will probably be in like the 12 or 13 minute range, not like the 16, 17, 18 minute range. And um, I imagine that he'll, he'll probably get a mixture of lead and secondary roles. You know, might have like a Kate or a Pete uh, play like the, the lead role in a sketch and Owen Wilson will probably be like a supporting character. So that's my prediction, probably around like 240. Yeah, I mean, if you look at the uh, the list from last season, we have that up on screen. If you are listening on audio, you can check out the YouTube video. We'll put all our charts up on screen. Uh, 240 is where Timothy Xiaomi was last season, and that is 13 out of 20 hosts. So you see him somewhere below average, uh, you know, pretty standard for a premiere. Um, the other interesting aspect we were talking about, you know, a uh, middle-aged dude hosting the premiere and being the oldest one to do it. Our friend Casey, uh, one of our patrons, is in uh, the chat. Uh, we're streaming live to our patron group right now and he says that the previous four middle-aged uh dude hosts for premieres have not been first timers so gosling driver harrelson chris rock so uh interesting point casey um i agree with you guys i don't think i wouldn't expect uh owen wilson to dominate the premiere i think that they're especially excited about these three new cast members we're going to talk through them um i think there's a lot of people that are returning and i think it's an underreported story that a lot of the cast members will be there this season i think people assume that a lot of people are going to be out for projects i think we're going to see uh we have 21 cast members i would expect that we're going to have on average 20 cast members there this season i don't think you're going to you know have 16 or 15 now will the show choose to not put all of them in the show that's that's a different story but i would expect to have them there in the premiere usually dominated by the cast Let's talk about Kim Kardashian. So this is an interesting one to talk about. Nicole, I know you re were really excited when this was announced. Where would you see her falling along the lists of hosts this season? Okay, here's my prediction. Kim Kardashian West, as she was referred to very worth notingly in the post-it and the announcement, KKW, I think she's going to be very high, but not have so much dialogue. I think that she will be in the frame very often, if they're smart, which they are, I think that it will really behoove them to have her, you know, on the screen as much as possible. In two years, five years, she will have a presence in these sketches and that people are going to comment on YouTube and it's going to carry a lot of weight. So they're not going to trust her that much, as much as I love her, to carry a lot of dialogue and a lot of important parts of a sketch, important moving parts of a sketch. But I do think they are going to position her to be physically present in as much as possible. That's what I hope that they do and what I think will benefit everybody involved. So I think she's going to be higher than Owen Wilson. Um, I don't know, maybe like a, like a two, 265, 270. So 265 would be about where Adele was last season. And I think that's like about uh, eight or ninth on, on the list uh, mm -hmm. there. Uh, the interesting thing, Mike, is that obviously there's a lot of comparisons between Kim Kardashian and the Elon Musk choice to have them host. Uh, I, I personally have expressed my opinion that I do think it's two different things completely. But I think that this is a common narrative in the SNL community right now that they're similar bookings. But we have Elon Musk last year who was on screen, but maybe not in the speaking roles in the way that Nicole described. And he was a 204 last year, which would be 17 out of 20 for the host. So do you think that Kim Kardashian could fall statistically in the Elon Musk range or he might be or she might be much higher? I think way higher. I, I, a comp I can think of is like season 45 JLo hosted and uh, I had her at a 304. Um, mm. so JLo was like on screen a lot, um, and plays herself. So, uh, it's a, you know, a tiny aspect of it, but we do, uh, reward, um, recurring roles or appearing as yourself just like gives you like a slight bump because it means that you're significant enough to come back with an existing character or just to appear as yourself in a sketch like, uh, JLo did in the Chad sketch with, uh, when A-Rod, um, popped into, um, so I, I can see Kim Kardashian definitely, you know, just 
you know, maybe it's kind of like a retrospective on the Kardashian clan, just kind of looking back and probably doing a big Kardashian sketch. I mean, of course she will. So, um, I think, I think, I think she'll be, be higher. I, I, I would say that she'll probably be a higher score than Owen Wilson. I agree. Uh, and by the way, I said Adele was uh, eight or nine be- before uh, she was actually seventh from last season. But uh, the I agree. I, I do think that we're going to get every cast member at least once in the premiere. I would expect that for episode two with Kim Kardashian, we are going to get by producer's choice, not all of the cast in the show that night. I think we're going to end up having a lot of we're going to have some guests walk in. We're going to have a lot of Kim stuff happening. So I would expect that maybe it's not uh, something that like it's not that Kim is making the effort to bump up her score tremendously on the host rankings. But the show, the way the show will be produced in week two will naturally give her more star power compared to week number one. So I think we all are in agreement on that. One other thing I, I'd like to add is we talked a lot about how Halsey was a strategic decision to be her musical guest that week. And I imagine that she that Halsey will be in a larger number of sketches than any of the other musical guests. I think they all might be in zero to one. I think that Halsey will be in two, maybe even three. Um, I think she's going to carry some of the weight that maybe they would expect a host to. So that might impact Kim. Yeah, that's a great point for sure. I, uh, you know, we can imagine young thug probably is in like one thing, but Halsey could be in a bunch. So it's a really good point, Nicole. uh, Let's talk about week number three. I mean, this is probably the hardest one to get a gauge on where this person will land, but we have Rami Malek coming in uh, more of a dramatic actor. Mike, do you have a, any guesses where you would see Rami coming in on this list? Um, I, I would say probably in like that 240 range, I put on Wilson, maybe a shade below. Um, and just one quick thing too, uh, Kim Kardashian will be the 198th woman to host. Um, so that means that looking ahead this season, we'll probably get the 200th woman to host. I don't know if SNL is, I would hope keeping <laughs> SNL is keeping up with, um, these numbers like we are, but you know, might be a cool thing to see who the 200th woman to host is. Um, yeah. But R- Rami Malek, I mean, we had six dramatic actors last season. Uh, Chalamet, Regina King, Rega Jean, Daniel Kaluuya, Carrie Mulligan, and then Anya Taylor-Joy. So I think, um, you know, they, they, they know how to use people like Rami Malek. And I, I also feel like they're always just like down to do whatever, you know. They'll put on any costume and, you know, do weird stuff. I mean, Peter Dinklage did space pants. I mean, something like that I feel like will happen, you know. Just so, just something weird that like people are probably the least uh, like stoked for that episode, but it'll probably be just like uh, maybe a good microcosm of the season's writing because they'll have someone who doesn't have an ulterior motive or a big um, you know presence that they can just say, "All right, we're just gonna write either slice of life down down the center lane or you know go off and do whatever we want because we can just plug in someone." who can read lines, who can memorize lines, who can be any character we want to just because we tell them to. Yeah, Nicole, I really feel like this Rami Malek episode will be representative or will will represent what the entire season will look like. I know there's going to be one-off episodes like these Kim Kardashian episodes that could be a little bit different, but I think your average season 47 episode could potentially be the Rami Malek episode. So that one, from a statistical perspective, is really interesting to look at for me because if we were going to just like, you know, comb through the data, let's examine episode three to see how great of a season season 47 will be. Yeah, I I agree. I also think that dramatic actors might they I'm not sure about the stats. You might you might know Mike, but I I imagine that they are in a given sketch for a long they or they can be for a longer portion of it. I feel like they, you know, I'm thinking of Adam Driver who has a lot of sketches where they're they're just these huge dramatic buildups and a lot of dialogue and and you know, these these big like speeches sometimes. So I am curious, he might be in the same number of sketches as another host, but I'm curious if he will have a higher score or just, you know, a higher pure screen time number because he'll be in the sketches for a longer chunk of the sketch. That's, that's my main thing. I'm curious to see. My only uh, point back would probably be that they would use them in pre-tapes. So pre-tapes are like, you know, uh, average sketch is like 
oh, at 330, 340, and average pre tape is probably like 220, 230. So I wouldn't be surprised if the film unit gets a good week um, with Ami Malik and um, probably puts out two or three pre tapes, whether they use all three or just use two. Um, you know, Adam Driver's done some great pre tapes too, like you mentioned. So I bet um, that'll, that'll be the case with Ami Malik. Yeah, and I'm excited to see that one. I'm also extremely excited to see what we're going to get from Jason. Uh, This one, to me, feels a little bit more obvious when it comes to numbers. We can talk through it. But last year, we had two former cast members come in. Uh, We had Maya, who was at 336 in terms of the uh, rankings. And Kristen Wiig was at 278. She was in fourth place in terms of the rankings. I wonder how it would be different this year because last year we didn't get a lot of former cast members dropping in. We obviously had like Tina, Rachel Dratch, we had Chris Rock. Um, But um, yeah, Chris Rock also hosting the premiere, like we said. But like in terms of cast members later on, because of COVID restrictions, we just didn't get a lot of guests popping in. I do have to wonder if guests popping into Jason's episode would potentially dilute his score compared to somebody like Maya Rudolph. But it's it's something to think about for sure. Nicole, where is your head at about the Jason episode? I think that's a great point, John, because Jason is someone who likes to make the people around him look better. That's one of the reasons why I feel like Ted Lasso as a an ensemble cast um, or, you know, he's the lead. But a lot of people, it, it's it just everybody is so beloved from that cast. And I, a lot of that is because of Jason and the way he operates. So. I think that compared to a Maya, the Maya episode with those cameos, I do think it will impact his screen time more than a typical host who is a former cast member, just because that's Jason's style. He he really makes the people around him look great. So, um, yeah, but I, the, a big question that we've all been wondering is what, how much are they going to go back versus how much are they going to look forward? The his His departure was kind of complicated. So I wonder if he actually maybe doesn't even want to look back. Maybe he wants to be very forward and present and emphasize the Ted Lasso, give us a little nostalgia, but we we don't know where, where his head's at. I'm sure that he's going to give a lot of input and the the crew and the writers are going to respect that input. So I, it could go so many different directions, but I, I don't know. We'll, we'll see. Yeah. Mike, where are you? Well, like, where's your head at about Jason Sudeikis' episode? Um, Well, first of all, I'm excited. I'm a huge Sudeikis fan. So that was, you know, if we didn't get him this season, I would have been shocked. Um, I, I think he'll he'll be really high up. I mean, they'll be hitting their stride. Um, you know, people perform the best when they know there's a break around the corner. So they'll be excited for him to be in the building. Um, you know, we had Mulaney and Chappelle at the end of that long uh, run of six last year, and then they got their first break. I I think as far as numbers, he'll he'll be he'll be north of three hundred um, one because he'll almost certainly make an appearance in the cold open. They're like long segments, um, you know, six, seven, eight minutes sometimes for the cold open. I mean, this last year's premiere, I think had a 14 minute cold open with Jim Carrey and Alec Baldwin. Um, so whether we see him do something political or not, I just think that show is going to open with like a Higgins voiceover. And then there's Sudeikis on the screen. I'd be shocked if, um, he didn't make his, his first appearances in the monologue. Uh, Maya Rudolph and Krasinski were in the cold opens last year. Um, other than that, I think think they're the only ones. Um, so I think Sidekus will certainly do that. So that'll, that'll boost his numbers, his screen time, everything. And as far as our recurring things, I mean, I think that's always overblown. People get excited about, oh, they're going to dig up this obscure thing. Like, they're not going to do that. They're, you know, Maya did Beyonce and Kamala, and that was it. So it's not like, we're, you know, you're going to get your favorite old thing, like, you know, oh, Will Forte will come back or um, Vanessa Bayer will be there. It's like, probably not. They'll probably utilize the cast. Why are you such a Debbie Jason. Downer? Yeah, I'm just, I'm a numbers guy. Sorry. No, <laughs> math doesn't lie. Um, yeah. But yeah, I think we'll, we'll get something cool from Sudeikis. Uh, and we'll get a lot of live sketches for sure. Um, so the opposite of what I said for uh, Malik, you know, we'll get, we'll get a sizable um, live sketches. So I think that'll, be, but yeah, he'll score high for sure. For sure. K- Casey in the chat, I'm with you as well. I really hope Forte does come back for a cameo or two. They could do an ESPN Classic or a John Bovey. That would be very, very exciting for me. Uh, guys, anything else about the host that you want to talk about before we move on to some of the cast members? Just uh, that uh, Sudeikis is the 34th um, cast member, um, to, be, to 34th person to have hosted and been a cast member of SNL. Um, so, cool. you know, out of 156, 57 people that have been cast members, 
you know, he's definitely upper echelon now. Um, he'll go down and hit in that list. It's a big, it's a good list. Exactly. So, uh, and he deserves it. So let's talk about, we have three new cast members. We have Aristotle, we have James, and we have Sarah, and we previewed them in our preview show a couple days ago. So we're not going to talk through necessarily all of the expectations, but we definitely want to talk about statistically where they might fit in in their first year. Before we get to that, Mike, we just haven't heard your opinions on the hirings of these three cast members. So give it to us. What do you think? Um, I always expect they're going to add least somebody last year they added three so um you know th here's three again i was surprised there's that many um but i think the, the first thing i noticed was I'm like oh three alliterative names um you know as an alliterative name guy i was like wow got a a j j s s um it's like oh there have been 10 other snl members that have ha had had uh, a litter of names like chevy chase denny dylan gilbert godfrey like those kind of people so i'm like wow this is kind of a weird coincidence um but yeah, I was like, okay, you know, I figured that if they're going to hire more people, it would be, you know, maybe lean into more diversity. I, I did a quick diversity metric for you, John, right before we went on to air. And I was like, okay, okay. is this the most diverse cast? And I was like, hmm, it's kind of been increasing a little bit. So I kind of just cross-referenced either, you know, with gender and then people of color versus not. So I was like, okay, this cast is like about like 40% diverse if you do those two and average them together and i was like and that's up 15 percent from 10 years ago so i'm sure some critics would say like oh i wish it were more diverse or like you know they're in the right direction you know but like you know it has been going up every year so i think that's a good sign and i was like wow season 36 there are only two women that were in the main cast abby elliott and Kristen wig um and they had two uh featured I'm like now there's seven women in the main cast and two featured women with punky and sarah um, so as far as the cast members themselves, I have no idea. Um, I had only heard of Sarah before, um, but I think it'll be fun. It's always fun to see people like you just never know what's, I mean, we, we came in with, uh, Lauren, Punky and Andrew, and I'm sure, you know, they, they all gained fans, you know, people that just like, were like really into them. So I'm sure that same thing will happen. People will be like out of nowhere will be a huge stand of all three of these people. Yeah, we also have two people with the same last name, Johnson, which it continues the SNL tradition of having multiple people with the same last names, including the Belushi's, Ackroyd's, obviously there's relations there, but uh, even uh, Rich, the Fallons, uh, the Halls. Halls yeah. yeah, exactly. So we've had a lot of those in our history. The, the Myers, even though they're uh, spelled differently. So <laughs> it's uh, there's a lot of those for sure. Um, Nicole, before we get into the data, anything else you want to say about the new cast members? Yeah, I'm interested to see how Sarah Sherman or Squirm, depending on if you know her by her stage name, Sarah Squirm, um, how she does, because she does this very extreme physical, like very art focused, art driven comedy. So I think that will either make her screen time stand out or not stand out. And, and I say that because I think if they use her, she's going to be doing what she does. I don't think she's going to be implemented that much for roles that anybody could fill. I could be wrong. I'm actually curious. I'm putting this out there and we'll see if I'm right or if I'm wrong in a few months. But I think that when she's on screen, she's going to be doing her Sarah stuff. So I think we'll, we'll see how that goes versus other, other first years who just kind of blend in and, and have small parts for the first couple of weeks that they're there first, first months. Yeah, it'll be interesting. If she ends up doing just pure uh, body fluid humor at the end of the show, will we call it uh, Sarah's squeam time? I wonder if we'll do that <laughs> moving forward. <laughs> All right, let's, let's bring up the data for the debut cast members that Mike put together. And Mike, why don't you tell us about this chart that's up on screen? We have a list of new cast members and the dates that they debuted. What are we looking at over here? All right, just uh, cherry picked, you know, um, well, not really cherry picked because it's everyone in the current cast. Um, I didn't include Che and Joe's because their debuts were, you know, on update and they obviously have a big segment. But I, you know, just, just people that are in a recent memory, some that had a splash or or not a splash, um, just just to, you know, see what it would look like. Um, whether or not first impressions uh matter and how if if so, then how much. Um so and, and I thought we'd also be surprised to see like, oh, you know, do you remember that episode that they started and their first uh lead um, how often does someone get a lead in their first episode? You know, we have, um, you know, a few here at the bottom. It hasn't happened in a while. Um, I didn't include everyone in the last, you know, since Keenan till today. 
um, just to kind of narrow it down. Because if you look at this list, you know, there are some people that are, you know, still in the cast, like Kate, A.D., Keen, and Cecily, and then some that are not, like, you know, John Renitsky or Luke Knoll or, you know, people like that. So we have uh, their name, how old they were when they started. I don't have the ages on the new cast members. Um, average person that starts on SNL is like 29.8. So you're like right under 30 is your time to get on SNL. So, um, John, you and I were running out of time. Um, yeah. <laughs> And uh, so, yeah, and like, look at how old they were when they started, when they start. Um, was it the premiere or was it mid season? Uh, Leslie Jones and Kate McKinnon, they were, they were like, you know, they came in when the season was already going. Uh, that's not, that's not terribly common, but it happens, you know, every other, every few years. I think, was it Sudeikis that, you know, he kind of came in and then next season they had Hader and Sandberg and Wig uh, join him. Um, and then, yeah, what their screen time was, how, how often did they appear and what was, in what capacity was their first appearance? Was it the, after the monologue sketch? Was it in the monologue being introduced? Uh, Tina Fey brought in the, the team of six that started that year. Uh, John Milheiser, Mike O'Brien, uh, Noel Wells, Brooks Whelan, along with Kyle and Beck. So it's kind of just like an on the nose intro. And then the last column is, like I said earlier, did they have a lead in their first episode? Yeah, so we so based on this chart, uh, if you were watching along, you'll see that no cast member that's been brought in since Mikey Day has had a lead role in a sketch. So that is interesting that since 2016, so in the last five years when they brought in new cast members, there's been a lot slower of a path for them to getting a lead role. And Nicole, I would have to think that probably has to do with cast size as well and the general direction that the show is going in where they're not looking to push these people too early. Yeah, that I think is a def definitely has something to do with it. Um, I think that with these, these big casts, I, I think a lot of the first years, second years, even third years, they hope, I think they're going to start having the expectation that, they might not have a lot going on the first episode and all of that, but it's um, it's it's going to maybe take a little longer than it did in previous years to make your mark. And that will be an interesting statistically to see if somebody does make their mark and has a lot of screen time as a first year, what are those reasons? And I, I think it'll have something to do with if you do something like with Sarah Squirm that no one else can do. She If she... D is doesn't do her art driven stuff. It's not like, oh, you know, there are four or five people on the cast who you could see in that role. So that might shoot her right, right really high up for the first few episodes, might not if they don't want to risk it too much. Um, but yeah, I mean, one thing that really sticks out to me is that I, which I, I hadn't remembered, Pete Davidson had a weekend update segment, and that's crazy to think about. So, like, right, right out the gate. So I think there was a lot of, trust in his stand-up from from the jump and obviously he's he's an update classic that's that's where i love him the most so it's it's cool to see that they put so much faith in him right from the beginning and and he was so so young and uh he's he's kept that streak and has has kept doing what he did in the first episode and that the fact that that's what he does best today all this time later is really cool to see Definitely. I mean, I I really feel I mean, our friend Jamie who's in the chat. He says that it's it's really interesting because it's almost like a baseball development system. And Mike, like, look, us coming from the sports world, we definitely are interested in the sports world. Uh, we definitely understand that you need to make your mark in order to get there. But it's really a matter of timing. Like, I think some of these cast members that uh, have had really unfortunate timing over the last few years where they've come in and not had the same opportunities to make their mark early and establish themselves like some of the cast members before that. So for somebody like Aristotle, uh, James and Sarah, our hope is that they're going to make their mark early because that really it really shows if you're able to do that for the most part. I say like in this chart, besides John Rudnitsky, I mean, most of the people who made their mark very early on have stuck around and have been on the show for a very long time. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, and I feel like there's like almost a concept of like just to go back to sports is like a, like almost like a red shirt year. Like your first year, you might not. Uh, make it onto things but i think that might be an indication of it just it just got cut so the writers lauren higgins they they know that you're working they know that you're funny they know that you're talented um but you know there are people in front of you so 
Um, you know, Heidi and uh, Chris, I feel like definitely were a victim of that. They they didn't get a lot of things going. And now everyone's like, oh yeah, Heidi Gardner, Chris Red, like they're like great SNL cast members. Whereas at the beginning, I remember myself included, we were like, oh, I really hope they keep Heidi Gardner because like, I think she's really funny. Like no one really knew her name. And I was like, that's someone that I hope, I hope, you know, they didn't give her too much of a chance. I hope that she sticks around. And then she does. And it's like, oh, it was obvious. They would have been insane to, to cut them, um, her and her and Chris. Um, so I think that's, that's definitely a thing that happened. So if you, if you're, uh, if you're starting on SNL and you don't have a great season, it might not be the worst thing, but you know, we can see a couple examples. Uh, this is obviously just one show. Um, but we talk about, um, someone who left the cast last season that sometimes you only get that one shot. So I thought it was just an interesting slice to look at, you know, if it's your first night and they're, you know, saying live from New York at 1140 and you're getting into your first costume or whatever you're about to do and make your first impression, like, you know, how will it go over? I, you know, like a look at 80 Bryant at the bottom. Uh, it was the last sketch and she just came up and said like two lines to Nassim Pedrad and then walked off. And now 80 entering her ninth season. So can go either way. Well, the other thing that I really like to point out, and I know we did mention th- this a little bit, but there's three names on this list that had their first appearances in the cold open. And that's Bone Yang, Beck Bennett, and Kate McKinnon. And these people have star power. These people have been on the show uh, in terms of, you know, Beck and uh, Beck has just left, but, uh, you know, Kate's been on the show forever. And to open up the season with your first time being on screen and you being in the cold open, I think that's like the biggest pat on the back you can get from the management at Saturday Night Live that we're going to put you in the cold open to start. So I think that we have to look for, obviously, if all of the cast members are in the cold open, that dilutes my argument. But I think that if it's if it's not the full cast and it's a, a smaller cast uh, driven sketch to open up the show on Saturday... I think that's a major endorsement for one or two or three of these people who have just been brought on. So, uh, Mike and Nicole, let me just ask you before we move on from this. Give me one of the three newbies that are coming on the season that you think would potentially have a lead role in the first episode if you had to pick. Nicole, go ahead. I got one. I don't want to say it out loud. But you have to. uh, I got to. Johnson, um, the the new Johnson, he has a Trump impression that I think I had seen, but I didn't, you know, put a face to the, a name to the face. Um, it's, it's one of the best Trump impressions I've ever seen, maybe the best. And I don't really need more Donald Trump on SNL. I thought we had kind of, you know, been, been done with that. We didn't really need to find reasons to bring back Alec Baldwin and talk about Trump, but I'm concerned that they will feel like They have to honor that impression. And I do think we are going to get some Trump centered sketches now that now that we have such an amazing Trump impressionist on the cast. It would have been great if we had that at the time, you know, from when when Trump was in office. But I yeah, I I would have rather have it have him be there when it was a necessity than now where I'm like, all right, we're going to have to find reasons to talk about someone that. I don't want to, I don't want to hear about it anymore, but I, it's worth it for the impression a little bit. Yeah. Uh, that, that's interesting. Okay. Mike, what about you? If you had to pick one of the three to have a lead role in their first episode, who would it be? I, at all or at the beginning, just in the whole episode. Um, yeah. In the whole episode, if you had to pick one, um, I go Aristotle. I think maybe just, uh, you know, he's like, could, uh, be coming in on that, like Mikey and Beck territory of just like, you know, just like good looking dude, just like being a lead in a sketch, whether it means he's like the zany character or not. I don't know his comedy style, so it's hard to weigh in on. But I would say maybe, you know, uh, you know, any just like some something different. So like give him, you know, maybe like the first sketch you're we're gonna have like a Mikey and Streeter sketch and he'll he'll be there or something. So um I mean I I'll be surprised if any of them have a lead in their first episode, but if I had to answer I'd I'd say I'd say Aristotle. Um and then just while we're talking about leads and uh, debuts, I would just point out that uh, Dismukes got his first lead in the third episode, um, Punky in the fifth, and Lauren only had one lead all season, and that was episode 12 on update. So uh, some people, you know, like we see in this chart, uh, episode one, season one of their career, they have a lead, and, you know, someone like Dismukes, he 
it had like a lead in the Jack Flats um, sketch with the Issa Rae episode, and then Punky with Stroll into the polls. So, you know, it, it takes takes a little bit. Well, I actually think I'm going to go three for three in a way where I'm going to think that it's Sarah that has her first lead role in the first episode, uh, just to, you know, say every single one. I think that the show was going for something different with Sarah, and I think they're going to want to show it off in the first episode. So I think that, uh, you know, there will be some type of pre-tape where she will have a lead role in that pre-tape. Or perhaps maybe they'll put her in a sketch. Maybe uh, like maybe against our wildest predictions, they're going to put Sarah in some sketch in the first episode just to show how different of a hire this is. Because I am excited to see what we're going to see from Aristotle and James, but I just think that the Sarah role in terms of her personality is so different that if you're going to bring her on, you might as well use her. That's what we would hope. So I would predict that that's who we get to see. Uh, anything else on the debuts of these three cast members, or should we talk about the rest of the cast? Okay, so let's do that. So, Mike, uh, we lost two cast members. We lost Beck Bennett and Lauren Holtz. I haven't gotten to hear your opinion on the departure of Beck, at least. So tell us what you think about that. Um, I, I was thinking that Beck and Kyle were leaving last season. I think it was kind of unpopular. Everyone's leaning towards Kate, AD, Cecily, or maybe Pete. Um, I just thought that... Um, I mean, as far as Beck leaving, like, this this way, it's like, I he was, like, so like a workhorse last season. I don't know what his plans are. I mean, I think he could have probably left three years ago and had a career ahead of him. But especially now, I mean, I think, I think a lot of these cast members, we could get into it, but like they're, you know, they've established their style. So people know what they're hiring if they want to put them in like a Netflix series or something. Um, but yeah, I was surprised to see Beck leave when, once I heard that he was the only vet leaving, I was, that's a surprise. Um, you know, leaving poor Kyle to himself. Yeah. Well, the thing I want to talk about next with the two of you is that obviously every year, Mike looks at the screen time of the cast members and he put together a chart that shows the increase or decreases in screen time between season 45 and 46. So now that Beck Bennett is gone and Lauren Holt is gone, who is going to take up some of that screen time? So let me bring up that chart and I will show that to you guys. And we have that up on screen right now. So we have our increases in screen time between 45 and 46. And Mike, just to clarify, for season 45, this does not include the at-home episodes, correct? Right. Just to get an even metric, I just did live shows. So it's that's why it says uh, 1 through 15. So 16, 17, 18 were the at-homes. I have okay. numbers on that. I just didn't include it here. Perfect. So the biggest increases that we saw last year in terms of screen time are Pete Davidson. He went up over 100% in terms of his screen time. He went up from 24 minutes in season 45 to 66 minutes in season 46. Obviously, there's more episodes to count. But really, just in terms of the rest of the cast, it's just a tremendous uh, increase. Uh, Pete, then Ego went up about 33%. Chloe is up 33%. Bowen is up 15, almost 16%. Beck went up 13%. Uh, che was up about 10%. Chris was up about 6 Heidi, uh, a little bit over 8%. So those were all our increases. Keenan was down almost 5%. Uh, Colin, almost uh, a little bit over 6 Kate, almost 7 Mikey Day was down about 8%. Kyle, a little over 12 Moffitt, a little over 13 Melissa was down 24% from the previous season. AD was down 40%. And Cecily was down 45%. Obviously, the caveat being that AD and Cecily were not around for a ton of or a few, at least, episodes last season. So the big question we have is Beck Bennett took up an incredible amount of screen time, I believe the most screen time among the cast members, right, Mike? Among the male cast members, Kate being number one. So Beck was okay. number two. Also, just to clarify, this uh, the increase is based on average because I'm going off 15 episodes versus 20 right. episodes. So obviously the totals will be different, but it's just average per episode. And um, like you said, 80 and Cecily missing time. Uh, Keenan missing some time. Um, uh, Pete missed five episodes in season 45. So that's why he's up top. So I think the real story is um, if you think that Ego had a good year, um, you're right. Yes, 100%. So uh, Beck was up, like we said, about 13.2% from 45 to 46. I know that he was in the most sketches last season as well. So there's a hole there. So Nicole, who is going to increase their screen time as a result of Beck not being there? To me, there are two 
parts. Beck, Beck is one of the most dynamic, versatile people who has ever been on the show, but I can separate it into two parts. So there are the the Beck and Kyle, you know, pre-tapes, their, their shenanigans that they've been up to since they got there. And that time will be absorbed by Dismukes, for sure. I think that he's going to be the Kyle's kind of sidekick. I, I hope in the first episode they do some sort of pre-tape to honor Beck. And it'll. I, I'm hoping that Dismukes kind of is the punchline, that now he's the the new person to to be Kyle's buddy. So I think that that's where that type of the the Kyle part of Beck is going to be all just mooks and I'm I'm all for that. And then the other part of Beck which is the 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 just the white guy that can do whatever the 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 politician in the news, the super generic dad, um 80 80 and Beck on in their Instagram stories both were joking about how their best role they've ever played was white mom and white dad, white couple. And and then Beck said that the best part about it was every time we did it, they were all so unique and different. And it's funny. It's really funny because they, they, I, I love them together as like a really bland, generic, middle-aged white couple. They, they, they kill that every time. So I think there's going to be, 80 is going to have a new husband and that could be a bunch of people. Um, but I'm thinking, I'm thinking that Alex Moffat and Mikey Day are going to definitely be absorbing some of that that white guy vibe, the the husband for eighty, the politician. He Beck just had, you know, Beck and Kate were the 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 best in terms of having so many political impressions. They they had a lot of staples and Cecily as well. But they just he had a lot of staples that I don't think because he's leaving they're going to necessarily fill. I think other people that we haven't predicted and can't predict are going to make other political figures more of a dominant presence on the show. And that doesn't necessarily mean it's someone that Beck would have played if he were there. So that part is harder to predict. We're going to see less Putin. We might see less Pence. We're, we're going to, it's going to kind of change up a little bit, but um, yeah. And then for the, for the new cast members, maybe they, they might absorb some of that in, in due time as well. Yeah, Mike, where do you see the Beck roles going now since we're going to have this hole in terms of who take, is taking up a ton of roles and screen time? There's, uh, there's one obvious answer. Keenan. Keenan plays off AD all the time. Um, so you're going to let, uh, and there's, there's plenty of Keenan uh, AD pairings. They play couples all the time. So Keenan just goes anywhere. So uh, Keenan missed uh, two shows last year. So this is going from 45 to 46. But if I had to go from 46 to 47, Keenan will definitely um, have a bump, and I agree. Um, I forget if it was you, or, uh, you or Nicole said it, Moffat, that um, he just like you know was so underused last year. So I th- I think him being back, um, he'll 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 definitely fill roles. I mean, Alex Moffat has shown that he can he can really do anything. He he plays the game show host. You know he can do that kind of stuff. Um, and then yeah, I, I just think uh, what we're seeing trending up, we're going to continue. And then since this is going back two seasons, we'll. Uh, you know, we'll see Dismukes, we'll see Punky more, of course. Um, and then, yeah, I, you mentioned at the top of the show, John, like AD and Cecily, I think they'll be in the building a lot. So whether or not that means we, we get more female-centric sketches, I mean, that, that'll that probably be the case. That that void of Beck will be, you know, more Kate and AD or Cecily and Pete or something like that. So it'll, it'll, it'll be a team effort. But as far as the newbies, who knows if they'll really step into a Beck role. Like I said, maybe Aristotle, but... Chris Red can do can do that stuff too. They all can do that kind of stuff. Yeah, I really think that Pete Davidson is going to continue his rise from forty five to forty six, and then forty six to forty seven. I think we're going to get a lot of uh, Pete sketches and Pete playing some of those roles. I think Alex is certainly an obvious answer for whatever reason they don't put Alex in those roles. It's hard to see them making the decision to put him there just because Beck is gone. Uh, I know there's new writing staff, but does that mean that the new writers click with somebody like Alex more than they did the year before? I'm not really sure. If that's an interesting logistical decision that I want to see play out whereas you know putting pete in a sketch you know that's going to go viral online no matter what you put him in so i really think that there's a lot of other aspects to putting somebody like with the name pete davidson in your sketches i think if you are a writer and you are you're going to want to write for pete because it's just you know your sketch might go viral and then you are more highly regarded in the writer's room so i really think that that is a certainly an aspect of continuing to increase and something that will probably be looked at more by SNL production is 
how big are these names and how big are they online? And can we put them in more sketches? Something that they didn't have to think about 10 or 20 years ago is, you know, if we put P. Davidson in something, it really changes the game. So I think that's a factor. And then my other like big thing that I'm thinking, you know, preseason is I think Kyle, his screen time is going to increase this season. And I think that similar to the way from 45 to 46, we saw this reinvigoration of Pete. We saw that he really seemed like he wanted to be there. He wanted to be in these sketches. Um, I think we're going to get that from Kyle in season 47. I said this in our preview show that I think Kyle Mooney needed Beck to leave perhaps for him to continue to be motivated to spread his wings. And I, I wonder if we're going to get, you know, people assume the new, maybe the new pair is Kyle and his mukes in the pre-tapes and Kyle and Sarah could be doing a bunch of stuff. But I wonder if we're going to get a different side of Kyle Mooney this year when he's not, you know, hanging out with Beck Bennett all the time behind the scenes and he's being pushed to do different things since he clearly chose that he wanted to stay on. So those are my two to watch in terms of taking, you know, increases, increasing their roles with the departure of Beck Bennett. The other change that we got was we had Chloe Feynman and Bo and Yang get moved up from featured players to repertory players. And Mike, I'll ask you, you know, in terms of your data analysis, how big of a deal is that? Or is it just the title? It's a big deal. I mean, it's just like it's it's job security. It's like, you know, at whatever your respective job is, you know, um, validating you as, you know, hey, you're you're one of the team members. We respect you. We appreciate what you bring to the table. Um, you know, but you know, if you're not fighting for your screen, I mean, you're, everyone's fighting for the screen time, but if you're not fighting for your career on SNL, um, you know, also I think they know what to do with them. I mentioned that earlier with some other cast members, but Bowen and, and Chloe, like we know what they bring. They do what they do well. Um, they don't do everything. Maybe that's some like a Beck Bennett does, but when they do do something, it's, um, it's well received. Um, Chloe Feynman, Britney Spears, you know. Oh, and Yang Iceberg, these things that were like, you know, so talked about last year, like we're going to see more of that for sure. So as far as screen time, definitely, I would see Chloe Feynman is like the next Heidi Gardner. So Heidi should be coming, becoming a uh, Cecily and Chloe should be coming a Heidi. Like that type of like, you can always play, you know, the girlfriend in the sketch, um, not just like the little girl in the sketch with Kyle, like, you know, the Grinch sketch or something like that. Like Chloe Feynman always, they always make her play like little kids. Um, but I think it just like, yeah, if you can solidify yourself in the team mix to be just a body on stage, being a repertory player versus a featured player is basically that difference, in my opinion. And the math backs it up is that you're just utilized more. So Heidi and Ego were utilized just way more post um, promotion. Also, it means that there's less of a risk of you missing a show. Like, you know, even last year we saw a lot of the featured players and even like, Chloe um, like missed the show last year. Like you know, they were on set. They just like didn't appear. So there's less of a risk of you just like you know not having a single moment in the whole night. Nicole, what do you think about this? The increase for Chloe and Bowen. Or what are your expectations as they move into the main cast? I think, given the fact that it is such a huge cast, and we're seeing some trends that support that and for better and for worse, it's pretty remarkable how much both of them, both Bowen and Chloe were able to really pop off, especially this past year. So because their second year was for both of them so awesome, I don't think it's going to be as much of a jump in terms of the data than a typical promotion from this from this point. Like Ego is a great example of her first year as repertory. She it, it, you know, the, the data was was very in support of how big of a deal it is. I don't think it will be as significant for Bowen and Chloe just because they have really established themselves on the show in a way that is not so common for, for second years. So I, I don't think we're going to see it as big of a jump, but I don't think that's a bad thing. So, uh, Mike, I know you had prepared uh, some other charts about the cast. I think we covered most of the things that we wanted to talk about with them. Was there anything else that you wanted to say about the you know cast changes before we moved on? Uh, no, um, the the, uh, the okay. totals were just the uh, totals to show um, back in Lauren. Lauren being the least screen time of the whole cast. So that kind of just tied in with the debut thing is like, you know, she only got that one lead and then you have a whole season and just a couple of bit rolls. And, you know, she had 18% of Kate's screen time. So 
Kate could have missed like 13 episodes and still had more screen time than Lauren. So if you don't, you know, if you don't get on the screen, it's kind of hard to get brought back. But um, Melissa and Punky barely had any screen time, and they're back. So you know, works out that way. Another thing was uh, Beck Bennett is had the, is the leader in uh, voiceovers, so someone has to take that. It's always him and Cecily. Um, so w- someone in the cast has to do more voice work next season. Yeah, if I had to pick somebody for that, I believe I would say Heidi. Maybe I know I know she did a couple things near the end of the season. I would think that that would be something. I know that's more the female uh, voiceover work, but I I do feel like she would probably take some of those roles. We are going to need a, a dude to to fill that role though, because for for me, it's always Beck and Cecily. Are I like I really only ever want to hear those two voices on in my in my voiceovers. So um, I, I, I think there's yeah yeah. Yeah, Higgins too. Respect on his name, but I I think there's going to be Beck is so dynamic, has so many different things, and people will absorb those roles in different ways. But when it comes to the voiceovers, I do think we're going to have a new Beck. That's that's the only category where I think there will be something as simple as the next Beck. Here, let me just throw this out there. This is kind of obvious, but kind of not. I think that the new Beck in terms of voiceover roles will be Steve Higgins' son, John Higgins, who is now hired as a writer. So he just like slots right in there into the voiceover work. I wonder how that will go. So <laughs> that's just uh, my wild card prediction. Uh, we said there's some records that are going to be broken this season. So um, I, you know, these are records that I follow. These are more counting numbers as opposed to the analytical numbers that Mike does. But to me, just as interesting interesting and just as important. Uh, let's talk about weekend update at first. So Joe and Shay are returning to weekend update. And this is a very big deal. It's, you know, like I saw a lot of people talking about how excited they were for the entire cast to return. But Colin Joe staying on weekend update and Michael Che staying on weekend update for the season. They are both going to pass Seth Meyers this year for the most times as a weekend update anchor, which, you know, like is pretty crazy because Seth was on the show for such a long time. Now, Nicole, the interesting part about this is Colin Jost is going to pass Seth Seth Meyers' record on the night that Jason Sudeikis hosts the show. So I have to wonder if Seth will be there that night. I I hope that they recognize the significance of Seth either making it there or not there, and they they plan for that accordingly. It's it's he's tied for first for the easiest person to to get to be there because he's he's right in that building. So him and him and Ballin. So I think that it's it would be worth it, but it, it might be kind of niche. It, it reminds me a little bit of the Andy Samberg, Bill Hader impression off. So Andy was about to be number one and then Bill was like, not so fast. Um, and then, uh, yeah, it's kind of like that. It, it might be a little too niche to make a joke out of it, but maybe maybe it'll it'll uh, you know catch some some ground on the show and um, it'll be pretty meta for us too if that happens. Yeah, it'll be really cool. And then also, Michael Che is going to pass Seth's. Uh, I guess it won't be a record anymore because he's always going to be about eight episodes behind Colin. But in episode number twelve of the season, which we presume would be sometime in February, probably uh, that will be when Che passes Seth for second all time. So they will be one and two all time by the end of the season. Pretty incredible, Mike. Yeah, I think it's an awesome record. I mean, it's definitely one when I do my uh, episode breakdowns that I like, you know, always mark the recurring how often, um, or, you know, how many times they've recurred as something. And uh, yeah, I was I was amazed last season. Um, I forget what it was now if I said, you know, by the end of the season, it'll be Joe's like 150th or something like that. I forget what it was. Um, but like, it, it's a huge record. I mean, Seth Meyers is like seemingly was just there forever. Um, he's so good at that job. Um, I don't think SNL would be the type of show to recognize it, unfortunately for us. But if they did, they'd probably go all in and bring, you know, Tina Fey out and Amy and Jimmy and stuff. Um, you know, even if you were around, you know, God rest his soul, Norm would never show up for that. But, you know, he's my all time fave <laughs> uh, update host. Um, but yeah, they did. They didn't they do some type of, uh, you know, video for uh, the update host and they kind of like, threw a joke in there some video to some you know to seth or something i forget what what it was um when when seth became the all-time i don't remember that um or it was when when seth left or something they had other update hosts like send him a message or something um i forget when it was but uh okay yeah i think i think it's like maybe it's 
weekend update is one of the aspects of SNL that's been there since episode one. So therefore, we have to acknowledge and respect it. And you know, to the longevity is is huge because you could so easily take someone off the desk, put someone else on, and we all just accept it because it's part of the show. So you know, it's not like our favorite cast member leaving. It's like, oh, that's like, it's. It's a tutelage of, you know, it's like a presidency or a monarchy, just like passing the the baton to the next um, next host. And I, if you told me that Michael Che and Colin Jost would have broken that record when they started, I would say no effing way because they were not good when they started. And now I love them. So, yeah, I wouldn't I would have been right there with you. Uh, and yeah, I mean, if, if that did happen, it would have been when Seth passed Tina because Tina was the uh, in the lead prior to uh, that. So those are interesting records. Uh there is the live from New York record, which is, you know, my personal favorite. I love to watch something like that. Uh, there's been a lot of people who have been gone through the history of the show and counted how many times somebody has said live from New York. Daryl Hammond has been in the lead for a very long time. And Kate McKinnon is now nine away from Daryl's record. So, you know, we're presuming probably a 22, 21 episode season. Can Kate McKinnon say live from New York nine or 10 times this year? I don't know, but it'll be really interesting to watch. Nicole, you're you're nodding your head. Yes, you think it's going to happen. That's crazy that that it's it's creeping up on us. I, I feel like we were talking about this even uh, like six months ago, and and the number was like twelve or something, and suddenly nine feels very close. So I think she will crack the record in the year 2022, and that implies a lot of different things. It I have, it's if she doesn't do it in this season that she would be a cast member next season and that she would say it. Um, I don't know if that'll happen, but I do think it will be broken in terms of any combination of things that could happen with Kate and her, her career at SNL. I do think it will happen in 2022. And if it doesn't, I think it will happen when she is a host after, after she leaves, I'm sure she will be a host at least once and certainly enough times that ultimately in five years, 10 years, 20 years, I think that the record will be broken, but it, a, a lot of different variables will have to kind of add up and, and align for that to happen. So it's, it feels feasible, but it also feels like it could so easily be just missed at the same time. Yeah. And it's so funny, Mike, because if she was at seven or eight away, maybe, maybe six, seven, eight, I would say she's going to break through the record this year. That's going to happen. She, she at least six times she'll say live from New York. Uh, you know, the whole cast said it, I think three times last season. So let's just say that happens again. So let's cut off three away. So that means she has to do it six times solo. Um, is it possible? I don't know. I just feel like that nine is in that like weird spot where she's going to be like one or two away at the end of the season. Well, last season was a season that we couldn't predict because of COVID and who's going to be around. I mean, I don't even know if we knew that Kate was going to appear in all 20 episodes, but she did. And she was in 15 15 cold opens and said live from New York 10 of those 15 times. So if we look at, you know, averages, it would say that she would hit about 10 or about 9 or 11 or something around there. So it's definitely possible. I mean, it's not crazy to think that she could say live from New York 12 times this season and completely break it if she said a 10 last year. Um, and yeah, they're all about the big group live from New York's and stuff. So she could say it. And um, like Nicole said, if she doesn't break it as a cast member in 47, then if she ever hosts, which I imagine she would because Kate McKinnon is synonymous with SNL at this point, that she would definitely be host if she wants to, that is host right away, um, would, would be in the cold open. Um, like Maya Rudolph and say it again. So, I mean, that's definitely, it's, it's definitely doable this year. It's completely on the table. Yeah. Jamie in the chat says, I think she hits it there. They do so many group live from New York's now. Uh, she might need an asterisk, but yeah, uh, that's, that's certainly understandable. I mean, Daryl in, when he had the record, I mean, he was doing so many solo live from New York's as uh, Clinton and, uh, later on as uh, he, he did a little bit of Bush. Like, I mean, he, he was doing so many political impressions, uh, Chris Matthews, like just a ton of stuff to open up the show in a different way than Kate is doing now. Kate is just like, I think Kate has more variety in terms of what she's doing to open up the show. So it will be really interesting to watch. The other number I would take a look at is Cecily. Cecily is currently in 10th place. Uh, she is three behind Beck Bennett, who has recently left the cast and Phil Hartman. So she's, uh, she's creeping up there as well. I mean, she is currently at, where is she? She is at, uh, she said live from New York 28 times. So it's possible that if she says it, 
uh, let's say nine times this season, she would be tied with Keenan. So Keenan also, who could potentially say it a few times, but like just like Keenan didn't say it at all. Uh, she's nine behind Keenan, who Keenan is in sixth. So she could jump up from like 10 to the potentially the top five this season as well. Keenan, if he says it a few times, he could pass Will Ferrell. He's one behind Will Ferrell. He is seven behind Alec Baldwin. So he could potentially get into the top four uh, for him. So those ones are the ones to watch in terms of live from New York. Then there's the all-time sketch list. And this is something that I've worked on all summer to try and get make sure that I had these numbers in order. And these are interesting records to talk about. Keenan Thompson is by far and away been in the most sketches in the history of the show. He is actually 53 sketches away from 1,500. So that is incredible for how many sketches he's been in since 2003. He is almost 500 sketches ahead of Phil Hartman, who is in second place. So it is just, like, he has that record above anybody else. It'll be interesting to see like those milestones when people get there. Keenan gets to 1500. You have to wonder what he will get to eventually when he's done with the show. Does he get to 2000, 2500? Like this is a record that I think will never be broken. So um, that will be interesting to watch. The other ones that our milestones are uh, Kyle is two sketches away from 500. So that will be uh, fun. I'm sure he's going to get there. Uh, Mikey Day is four sketches away from 400. Heidi is 10 sketches away from 300. And Chloe is eight sketches away from 100. Bowen is 13 away. So those are little milestones that we'll look at as we move forward. Uh, the one that I think is interesting is actually, uh, I'll, I'll have you guys guess, because I don't know if you know the information. If you had to tell me which cast member besides Keenan has appeared in the most sketches that's currently active, who would you say that is, Mike? The current cast? Yeah, out of the current cast besides Keenan, who, which cast member has been in the most sketches in their SNL career? Um, it's not Kate. Well, is that your guess? That's what I'm asking. <laughs> oh, yeah, Kate. Yeah, Kate. Okay, Nicole, what about you? I'm going to say a different answer. So we, one of us is right, Mike. Hopefully, I'm going to go with 80. Okay, you're actually both wrong. It's actually Cecily. Cecily has <laughs> been in the more sketches than Kate McKinnon and A.D. Bryant, even though Kate started a few months prior to uh, to Cecily joining the cast. Uh, Cecily's actually passed Kate for more sketches in terms of the history of the show. She's actually tied for fifth all time right now in terms of sketches in the history of the show with Bill Hader. So if you think about how you know impactful Bill was in the show, Cecily has been just as impactful in terms of how many sketches she has been in. She's at 805. She is about 21 sketches away from Daryl Hammond, who is in fourth place. Fred Armisen is in third place at 881. So to do the math on that, she's about 76 sketches away from Fred. It is certainly possible that Cecily could get into the top three by the end of the year in terms of all time sketches. Kate is 17 sketches behind Cecily. Could she get there as well? That will be something that we should watch as we go. I know you guys also mentioned 80, just to just throw out the last number. 80 is in currently in 17th place all time at 629. Um, and Kate, Kate was 788 and Cecily was at 805. So uh, 80 significantly behind the other two. So that that shows that uh, voice voiceover work is big. Yeah, Cecily being sure. ahead of Kate. I mean, you said she's thirteen behind Kate, uh, ahead of Kate. Uh, seventeen. Yeah, seventeen. Yeah, I mean, she can do fifteen voiceovers in a season. So that's that's big. Definitely, uh, Nicole. Any thoughts on this in terms of the, the all time sketch list? Yeah, I was I was going to say the same thing, Mike. That the the voiceovers really definitely push push Cecily above Kate. And it just, I think the voiceovers are, are an overlooked part of the show. And it's, it's so iconic to be that voice. We all have this, there, there's just something about a, a, a commercial voice or a, an intro to a talk to all these things that, that are such comforts. And I think it's subconscious comforts. We don't even realize how comforted we are when we hear Beck or Cecily's voice. It's, there's so much psychology around this with, with commercials and, and who, who is hired to do commercial voiceover work. It's, it's, it's just fascinating to me. So I, I'm, I'm really interested in, in looking at voiceover work for, for this season. And 
yeah, I, I, I was in between AD and Cecily. I wanted to be a contrarian, but honestly, I, I was, I was going to go with Kate too. But it, now that we're talking voiceovers, it makes perfect sense. Yeah, so we're definitely going to put on social media, Nicole, uh, the, the sketch lists and you know when they pass certain records as we go through the season. I think it's super important and something that people would find interesting. Um, so that about does it for certain data things. But I know, Mike, we have a fun game that we like to play on the By the Numbers show. So you guys, you guys up for a game? Okay. Mike, tell everybody what this game is if this is their first time checking out the By the Numbers show. So it's like a it's like a fantasy football build your your team game. You get a budget. In this case, I made it twelve dollars. I put a uh, a five groups each have a value four dollars, three dollars, two dollars, one dollar, and fifty cents um, to purchase each cast members to build your most valuable cast. I mean, the way we play it on this show because it's an analytic show um, is you know you want to try to score the highest, but if you want to play just pick your favorite cast members. That's totally cool too. Um, John, do you want to read the cast members or should I? So, so I'll read it out. I know you said you wrote here, spend $12. Were we doing, I think we were doing 25 last year. Was that different? This we year? were, I just, you know, it was the cast got bigger and I eliminated um, uh, Che and Jost um, from the game oh. just because I thought it would just, you know, make it um, have more parity. Um, and I, I took away the $5 value. So I just uh, decreased it and it makes the math a little bit easier too have an even number and have um no value of five at the top so uh, okay about it perfect so well so while i read this out nicole just you mark down who you would like to put into your cast mike i'll ask you to do the same and i'll read this out to the listeners um and we'll have some fun and again like i said patrons if you're watching along let us know who you would pick for your uh build a cast so at the four dollar value we have 80 bryant kate mckinnon cecily strong and keenan thompson at three dollars we have Mikey Day, Pete Davidson, Heidi Gardner, Ego Nwodum, and Bowen Yang. At $2, we have Chloe Feynman, Alex Moffat, Kyle Mooney, Chris Redd. At $1, we have Andrew Dismukes, Punky Johnson, Melissa Villasenor. And at $0.50, cents, we have our three new cast members, Aristotle, Sarah, and James. So you can include them as well. And just for anybody watching after the fact and watching along, these are all completely subjective <laughs> numbers based on the rankings that Mike and I looked at. We try and be objective in terms of the data, but based on what we see in terms of screen time and appearances, we have chosen these numbers accordingly. So don't cry foul when you see that your favorite player, Andrew Dismukes, is only at a dollar. It's just based on what he has done on the show so far. So if you think he's at very good value for a dollar, definitely buy him as you build your cast draft. So, Nicole. Can you tell us who you would pick for your cast? Yes. Okay. So I went, every time I, I play this game, I do it a little differently. This time I'm going for future value. So I'm investing in some players that are a little less expensive, but I think I will get a really great return on my investment with everybody that I pick. So I did three people for $3. I'm doing Pete for the mo for number one reason is because of what we talked about with the viral I, I'm the biggest Pete fan, but even more so than that, I just, I want somebody who is going to be viral and, and I think that's going to help the show succeed a lot. And so I'm going to put a lot of money into someone who's a big celebrity outside of the show. I think that that adds a lot of value for Pete. Um, I'm going to do Ego for $3. I think that we're going to find that she, she shoots up pretty quickly as we, as we go through the game, she's, she's going to be worth more very quickly. I'm going to do Bowen for three. He is just the future. I, I'm the biggest fan. I also think he is going to be similar to Pete in the sense that he will have some like some outside of the show influence and he's building up such a strong fan base outside of the show. And I think he's going to kind of have a similar thing with that Pete has in terms of if you put Bowen in something, it's going to get a lot of attention. I really, I think that's what's going to happen with Bowen. And then I'm going to do Chloe for two for similar reasons. As I've said, I think that her stock is going to rise. And then I'm going to do Dismukes for a dollar. I, I'm, I'm expecting a lot from, from Dismukes. So just to read it quickly, I'm going to do Pete, Ego, Bowen, Chloe, and Dismukes for 12 bucks. Okay. Mike, what about you? Who are you going to pick based on these numbers i wasn't planning on on playing because i always you know, make you play all right okay um 
I also like similar to Nicole. I'm completely flipping my strategy from way back in um, October of 2020 when we played it with the great Andy Hoagland um, back in the OG days. I'm not doing a lot of mid level. I'm going to the top. I'm taking Keenan. Got to take Keenan for four dollars. It's a steal. So I'm doing Keenan for four. Mikey Day for three. Um, Chris and Chloe at two each. And then just to round out my cast and spend my extra dollar, I was debating Dismukes. I was saying maybe Melissa finally gets some, something this year. I'm going to take Aristotle and Sarah for 50 cents a piece. So that is Keenan, Mikey, Chris, and Chloe. And then two of the rookies, Aristotle and Sarah for 12 bucks. Yeah, this is tough. I mean, twelve dollars. I was not expecting the twelve dollar. That that really, I'm trying to like figure out where to get everybody in. I think for me, I think Aristotle and Sarah are no brainers. Uh, sorry, James, but I just think that it's you know that they, it'd be interesting to see what we get from them. And I think for fifty cents value, uh, that stock would probably increase. So I'll get my dollar there. I think in the one dollar value, I'm going to go with Dismukes. I think that uh, out of the three punky Dismukes and Melissa, I think uh, Dismukes has the highest value. Here here because when we come back to do this later on in the season i think we're gonna have this mukes at one of those higher levels uh i think i'm gonna go chloe Feynman at the two dollar level i think chloe is the you know the one that i like i said i want to pick people who are going to be rising i want to get them at low you know buy low sell high type of thing i think we're going to be buying low on chloe over here then we also have Pete Davidson, I know Nicole said it. I think that Pete is just, you know, like I like what he was doing. I never a couple of years ago would have done this, but I really feel like I, I'm enjoying what Pete, Pete is putting into his sketches right now. So I just want to make sure I'm doing my math correctly. I have $1, $2, $4, uh, $7 there. Um, and then I think I'm going to go with Keenan. I think Mike made a really good point. Just having Keenan there is such a, a like overwhelming uh, settler for the cast. It's just really, he can put him in anything. You can put him in any role. Uh, it kills me not to put Heidi Gardner, but you put such a small uh, budget that I think that she's just like the first person out in terms of what I'm looking here. Even Ego as well. I mean, those there's just so many good threes and fours, but I think I think Mike probably of the three of us, when you guys are listening and you're playing on this game, I think Mike probably had the better strategy compared to Nicole and I, where he started from the top. He took the people that he knew that he needed to have, and then he filled it out with the younger people. Whereas uh, Nicole and I looked at the steals that we could potentially get at a lower level. And then by the time we got to the top, we're like, ah, we ran out of money. So I'm I'm curious to see how the listeners did it as well. So um, that was really fun to do. Mike, uh, do you also have some over unders that you wanted to give us before we head off? Yeah, I do. I just uh, three things. Actually, wait, hold on. Know. Let me just let no, me just, go ahead. Just give me one second. Yeah, sorry. Yeah. I just want to make sure that I can uh, get this in. Uh, we also have Casey in the chat. One of our patrons says that he is going to pick for his team. He's going to put Dismukes, Punky, Melissa, Aristotle, Sarah, James Austin Johnson, Ego. Chris Red and Kyle. So, I mean, if you're able to put that many people in the cast, Casey, that's pretty impressive with the math. He says, if he's not mistaken, it comes out to about $11 and 50 cents. That's just the cast that he wants to see. So thanks Casey for that as well. Uh, Mike. So you also said that you had some over unders that you wanted to uh, give us. Then we'll, we'll play those and then we'll wrap up, wrap things up. Right. Yeah. Just uh, three quick ones. So I'm going to give you a number and then if you think this season it'll be over that number, you'd say over. And if you think it'll be under that number, it'll be under. Very common in sports betting. So bringing it to SNL. Um, first one is Kate McKinnon update desk pieces. So Kate McKinnon's appearance is an update, but I would say for the purpose of this game, it has to be like she slides over and talks to Joe Sturche, um at five and a half. So... I will, once you answer, I have the anti uh, stats on last season for precedent, but I want you to give, um, give me your answer before I give you the context. So Kate McKinnon update five and a half over or under. I think I'm going to go over. I think for me, I think I'm going to say she's an over. I mean, the, the big question that I know a lot of people are having is that is she going to be out doing other things? Uh, is she not going to be there for every episode? I think if she misses some shows, the under was probably the better bet. But I think if she is there for 21 shows this season, I think there's a good chance we're going to get her on update for at least six of them. So I think I'm going to take the over. Nicole, what about you? I was going to go under because of what you're talking about. I'm it's more I'm, I'm manifesting under because I really want to see Kate have to miss episodes. I, I think it's it's 
a, a good thing that when you are up at that four level that we're talking about to have to miss episodes. And I think she's the only one at that level that it, based on those rankings for the game we just played, who has not had to miss a significant amount of episodes for outside projects. And I think that has to change. I Kate is so talented and, and we need to start seeing her have to leave the show for weeks at a time to do other things and spread her wings and fly so that when she leaves, we know that she's going to like land on her feet and, and have places to go and, and projects to work on. And it's, I, I think this new era of, of SNL is very much about stay longer as long as you are expanding your, your reach so, while you're still here and you're doing a lot of projects. And, and she, she did a lot, I feel like two or three, four years ago, she did a lot of interesting things, but she has to increase that so that once she leaves the show, it's because she has so much outside going on that it's not worth justifying anymore. So all that's to say, I want it to be under, not because I don't love Kate, but because I, I want to see her have to be somewhere else. Okay. Sometimes. Makes sense. Mike, what about you? Um, my guess or I want the context. Well, I guess you you have the answer from last season, so give us that. Yeah. Um, so last season, Kate um was in all 20 episodes. She appeared very like clockwork regularly on update. It was six times in 20 episodes, basically every three and a half episodes, you know. So she did uh two as Dr. Wayne we notice. I don't know if we'll see him this season. Um uh, Giuliani, I don't know if we'll see him. Um, and then like, so some of them might, you know, she ha- might have to do some oldies or have some new characters because I don't know if she'll do those ones again. And then, you know, I don't know how relevant Liz Cheney is or if, uh, her and 80 will do, uh, Wiley and Vanetta Starkey again. I don't think they'll do that twice in a row. Oh, but yeah, no. so, so, uh, <laughs> look at the sheen on that Colin. Um, so yeah, it's uh six, she did six last year. And then the caveat was what we talked about, like, Will she be, you know, abroad filming her show like and miss any time? Because last year we thought she might and she didn't miss a beat where, you know, Cecily was out the whole beginning and 80 missed like seven episodes. Um, you want to move on to the next one? Let's do it. All right. This one's this one's a, 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 a popular one, I think. Uh, how many times will Cecily Strong sing in season 47? I'm setting it at 10 and a half. Ooh. Uh, Nicole, do you want to go first on this one? Yes. I'm going to go under. And for a similar reason, I think that she is going to, on, on one hand, she's going to have to be selling her singing as much as she ever has been for, for her Schmigadoon project. She's always going to want to have that in mind to give people a reason to go tune in there. With that said, I don't know. I haven't been watching that show, so I'm not sure if it's a miniseries or if it's getting another season. Um, if it is getting another season, she'd probably be taking some time out. Maybe in the kind of mid-season is, is when I imagine a second season would be filming, maybe the spring. So I think Cecily's going to miss maybe just as much this season as she did last season. And because of that, I'm going under. However, I do think when she is present, a higher proportion than perhaps ever before will be singing because that's, you know, her, her PR strategy as a performer should be to, you know, shove, shove that in there wherever she can fit it for, for the success of Schmigadoon and her, her future as someone who has the, the acting, the comedy, and the singing on top of everything. So Makes sense. I think I'm with you, Nicole. I think we're going to keep it simple. I think it's going to be under that number. Um, I know that she has had probably Mike's going to tell us she had seasons where she sung a lot more. Um, but I, I, I don't know. I'm just going to go. I'm going to go with under. What about you? What do you think, Mike? All right. So again, the number was 10 and a half times for Cecily to sing in any capacity. Um, so that the crazy thing is she was in studio for 14 episodes last year. She missed six shows. Um, and she still sang 11 times last year. Wow. So <laughs> that's incredible. Mathematically, you got to pound the over on that one. And I was going to say what Nicole said, which is, you know, hey, Cecily's singing. Like, maybe I should check out her like musical show. So she might now be lobbying to sing more than ever before. Um, so, you know, the gambler in me would be say, I, I got to take the odds on the over on that one. But, and again, like, if these people are coming back for their like, big curtain call i mean look at cecily's like faux curtain call last year singing as janine Pirro. like 
you've got to imagine, for better or worse, if you're an SNL fan, that these people, 80, Kate, Pete, Cecily, are going to just do what they do. They're not going to change the game um, in their last season. If they, you know, last season wasn't their last season, and this season almost certainly should be or could be. So I imagine that we're going to get plenty of Cecily singing this year because they always just find a way. Okay, well, we may have made the wrong choice there, but I guess we're going to have to see. Uh, what is the third over under, Mike? The last one is just um, one we touched on earlier is uh, how many times will Kyle Mooney appear in a pre-tape? I thought this one was a little bit more fun because there's no Beck and Kyle gets relegated to YouTube at cut for time. So there's two factors that could kind of mix in here. The number I set it at was nine and a half. So if we're to assume this is a 20 episode season, and Kyle Mooney stays the entire time. Will he appear in over or under nine and a half pre-tapes? Are we including cut for time ones that make it to YouTube? No. It has to be oh. on the show to be canon SNL. And it's nine and a half? Nine and a half. Is your your number? I feel like I am going to take... What, give us the over-under one more time, Mike. Which What, what is it? Nine and a half pre-tape appearances for Kyle Mooney has to air during the show. I think I'm going to take the under on that. I think I'm going to continue my pitch that he's going to be doing different things this season and he's going to be in more sketch work. I think with the please don't destroy people being hired as the uh, those writers, I think they're going to be doing some pre-tapes. I think we're going to see some stuff from Sarah. I think that the pre-tapes, uh, we're going to keep going with like some of the Pete and the hip-hop stuff that we saw that really went viral, a lot of those. I think the days of Kyle Mooney uh, creating behind the scenes stuff or like inside SoCal, like all the stuff that he has done previously for pre-dates. I think he is heading to into more sketches this season. So I'm going to take the under. I, this is tough because I agree with you that there is less room and less reason for him to be in pre-tapes this season between the new, the new writing hires and Sarah, there's, there's a lot. And, and also his, his partner in crime leaving every sign points to Kyle will be in fewer pre-tapes, but there are no signs pointing to Kyle will be in more sketches. So Kyle just might really suffer and take a, a big fat blow this season with, you know, just the, the short end of the stick with sticking around and, and we'll see if, I'm I'm sure there if if Beck was leaving, I'm sure that Kyle had to have have thought about that. So about leaving himself and and the fact that he chose to stay means that I do think he's going to have to in 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 staying, he's going to have to figure out how to push himself and do things that he hasn't done before on the show. But I I I think we're going to have to revisit this conversation and see if it was a good decision for him to stay if he's getting enough screen time for him to want to be there. It, it might, he might really suffer under all, all these new, these new writers and, and cast members. So I was going to say over, but I'm going to agree with you, John, I'm going to go under. And I don't think it's because we're going to see him more elsewhere. I just don't think we're going to see him that much. Okay. Interesting. Mike, any opinion on this? Uh, last season, Kyle appeared in 11 pre-tapes that aired on Saturday night. So if you included the other ones, I mean, I think he had, he had a great pre-tape that uh, even Michael Che made an appearance in that was cut that I was bummed that didn't make the show. Um, but yeah, so 11 last season, I'll just repeat what I said about people doing what they do best. I think that it doesn't have to be a Kyle Mooney centric pre-tape. You know, it, it can just be like him in the Nick Jonas bachelor party sketch. He's just like a guy who can perform well, in those formats, you know, on a set like that, he's just great at, at doing it. I mean, he, he was in Brigsby bear, um, as the lead, you know, he, he has, he has done film. Um, so I, I don't have an opinion either way. I mean, math could tell me one way cause that's, you know what I'm doing here. But, uh, last season was 11 and you could say the cast is a little bloated. I love the idea of the, um, the please don't destroy guys. They'll probably want to do a lot with the film unit. Um, and of course like Pete and Chris doing hip hop, um, but yeah, I think that's like, that one's just like right there. Nine and a half. It's like, cause he could be in Stop. three in one night. You know, um, he did one with Daniel Kaluuya, the, uh, 
YouTube sketch, like things like that, that you wouldn't even think it was like a very Kyle Mooney thing to do. Like you wouldn't see, Oh, Daniel Kaluuya is hosting this week. I, I guarantee he's doing a pre-tape with Kyle. Like you would never say that. So um, they don't have to always have to be just him, you know? So I, I think that Kyle Mooney, I, I'm like keeping my eye on him this year. I mean, I've always been a big um, Kyle and Beck fan. So I'm, I'm like, actually, even though it's a bummer, Beck is gone. I'm like, I think it's like kind of exciting to see Kyle Mooney sticking around and like, what he wants to do to the show, especially if it's his last year too. It's just, he's going to be very fascinating to talk about all year long to see what he is doing. So if it's going to go in more of the direction that I think, or he's just going to disappear from the show, like Nicole said, so it'll be very fun to watch. Um, Mike and Nicole, this was so much fun to talk about all the numbers, all the analytics as we get to season 47 coming up in just a few days. Uh, Let's talk about what's happening at the SNL Network. I'm so excited about everything that we have been doing. Every single week, we put out our schedule on social media of all of our shows happening at the SNL Network. So in case you missed it, on Monday, we were live talking through everything from the preseason and the differences uh, between this show and that show is we did a lot more detailed examination of why Beck and Lauren are no longer part of the cast, um, why these three new hires were made, and what we think uh, is going to be happening in season 47. And then, obviously, we have this show coming out by the numbers. And then on Saturday night, it all comes together. We have our episode number one with Owen Wilson and Casey Musgraves. As soon as that episode is done, join us on YouTube. We'll be on about 10 minutes after the show is up for our Saturday night hot take show. We will be there each and every week to break down the hottest takes from the show. And then, of course, next Monday, we'll be back with our roundtable where we'll talk about everything a little bit more from a macro perspective perspective what that show meant in terms of the history of the show we also have announced recently that we have our patreon we are streaming right now to our patron group so our amazing patrons can see us record this show live they get a lot of behind the scenes content of everything that we're doing at the snl network we're also going to have a ton of patrons on podcasts this season as we produce patron feedback shows we also are going to be booking interviews with snl alumni and our patrons can call in and ask questions to the alumni and be a part of those interviews we have our private patron facebook page going right now and as we we start getting exclusive news about the shows that you have seen us put on social media. We are going to release that first and a lot of extra information to our patrons as well. So if you want to uh, join the SNL Network family, we really, really would love to have you check us out at patreon.com slash the SNL Network. Mike, where can people reach out to you if they want to get a hold of everything that you're doing? And I know you had a very viral tweet on Twitter this week. Uh, at SNL Mike Murray. That's that's me on Twitter. So I'll be posting more this year. I have tons of backlogged stuff um, to post that I've just been waiting for a uh, season to get back to um, more eyes on the show. But you find me on Twitter. Um, ask me for specific stats um, or follow ups on stats that you want to see. So I'll I'll be there. Yeah, Mike is a great follow if you really love the nerdy stats data. He's just like the perfect person to follow for all of that stuff. Uh, Nicole, where can people reach out to you? You can find me at Nicole Rovine on Instagram and Twitter. Uh, I'm always active on Instagram, and I've been trying to up my Twitter game recently with everything pop culture. Definitely SNL, once once it gets back, I'll, I'll have some stuff to say. But I... My content plate with pop culture is very full right now. So I'm talking about everything. I, I'm watching Dancing with the Stars and The Voice simultaneously. They're both, they air at the same time. So I'm doing both of those. I'm doing Survivors Back. I'm doing Bachelor Nation is constantly so in my face and I'm eating it all up like an idiot and I love it. So I have a, a lot to say about a lot of things and I am trying to be more active on there and it's it's been a lot of fun. So follow me on either of those if you want to hear what I have to say about different different things going on. Yeah, thank you, Nicole. And you can always always follow me on social media at John Schneider 24 anywhere. If you have ideas, suggestions, you know, things you think that we can do to continue to improve the SNL network as we are building our community, uh, please reach out. I'm always excited to talk to everybody who listens to our shows. You can follow us at the SNL network. We are being very active on Instagram, Twitter. Uh, we're going to get on that TikTok game soon. So I'm really excited for everything we're doing on social media. Uh, if you are listening and you 
haven't subscribed yet, subscribe to us on YouTube or on any podcast or those subscriptions really help people find the shows. I certainly appreciate that. And if you are listening and you on audio and you can give us an Apple podcast review, uh, those are really important as well to help people find the show. So for Mike Murray, Nicole Rovine, and myself, John Schneider, I just want to thank you all for joining us on our season 47 preseason by the number show. We will see you on Saturday night for episode number one with Owen Wilson and Casey Musgraves. Have a good one, everybody. See you next time.